Welcome to the Believe Podcast Network, SoCal Sweat. My name is Ann McDaniels, a former NFL cheerleader and product manager turned actress and model who dreams of being a UFC fighter. Meow. Learning strategies to help motivate others leads me to bring you interviews each week from a range of athletes, experts in fitness and nutrition, and so much more. Thanks for listening to Believe, the number one podcast for working professionals. And let's push our endorphins to higher performance through SoCal Sweat. This is your host, Ann McDaniels. And thank you so much for joining me on another episode of SoCal Sweat. Now, today we're going to be talking about the term orthorexia. What is that? Have you heard of it? Maybe you've seen it on magazines and social media. Again, it's called orthorexia. It's when a passion for healthy eating becomes unhealthy. It was actually coined in the late 1990s by Dr. Stephen Bratman, a physician who coined the term and offers that all day long orthorexics will obsess about food prep, research, when to eat, how to eat, they obsess over every morsel, and have a fixation on righteous eating. Again, it's when a passion for healthy eating becomes unhealthy. As we all know, the health and wellness industry is a multi-billion dollar industry full of brands, supplements, new diets, new workouts, obsessions over eating clean, being gluten-free, being with macro and micronutrients. Influencers, social media, magazines, everyone sends a different message and it can be very confusing. Now, the DSM-5 which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, does not coin the term orthorexia as an official eating disorder. It is unlike anorexia and bulimia. Why? Anorexics and bulimics usually have a desire to be thin and are fixated on body and appearance. Now, for orthorexia, it's not an obsession with being thin but rather being overly focused on healthy eating, healthy lifestyle. They want to be nourished properly. It's how they identify themselves and find their own self-esteem. Now, this usually belongs to athletes, overachievers, who may have to maintain certain weight classes. Or someone could just start out with an elimination diet and may cut out certain processed foods, foods, which is always great, Of course, it's good to have things in moderation, but someone might start cutting and then all of a sudden become a vegan with all the cutout foods and then they become obsessive and things can spiral out of control. This happens everywhere. And these orthorexics will obsess about the food prep, the research, when to eat, how to eat. They obsess on every morsel. They fixate on righteous eating. Again, obsessive, rigid, extreme, and flexible. They create black and white rules for themselves. They're overachievers. They have a fear of illnesses or how food is impacting them. They're highly anxious when around food. They become defensive or irritable with foods that make them uncomfortable. They can be full of anxiety over the food if it's not gluten-free prepared properly with the right types of greens, micro and macronutrients. Again, they want to make sure that they prepare their own food. Or if someone else is preparing the food for them, they constantly watch them or call ahead to a restaurant. Or they won't touch anything not prepared by themselves. If the food doesn't turn out to be perfect, it can be thrown away. Many of these orthorexics stock farmers markets, which with and they look for things that have to be all non-gmo or even have to have to buy from farmers that are within five to ten miles of where they live often they spend so much money that they go into debt shopping calling ahead to restaurants obsessing over recipes lots of pre-prep prep and ahead of time and again Prep eating is great as long as it's it, it's sustainable and doesn't make you become obsessed. Again, people with orthorexia have an extreme commitment to healthy eating. They're not driven to lose weight, but rather they want to eat the right way. And misinformation from wellness influencers who may not know what they're talking about can make the problem worse. 
Every day is full of anxiety for them. And again, not an official eating disorder, but more of a person who just takes it too far. Often, they can be a pure, righteous, perfectionist eater, zealots. They could talk to others. They could be at a dinner and berate others for what they're eating and sort of bragging about how they're eating better than they are. And, you know, it, sometimes people will be, will be turned off by this, and that can be rather, you know, alarming, and, and, and people can lose friends over this kind of thing. I've, I've seen it. I've actually seen it. Um, and again, they can create social isolation out of fear in eating the wrong foods they cannot control. Now questions to ask yourself, or if you're a fitness, a fitness trainer, and, or you have a friend, ask these questions about yourself or that person. If it were to be for yourself, do you wish you could not worry about the quality or quantity of the food that you're consuming? Do you wish you could just live your life like a normal person, quote unquote? Would you love to try not to, would you love to try not to control food and how it's served, asking constant questions so that you could just relax and enjoy life? Do you feel guilty in your life when you stray away from your perfect diet? Do you feel more in control when on this diet? Do you constantly look for ways for, to look for why food is unhealthy so you can make an excuse as to why you cannot eat those particular foods? And do you put yourself on a nutritional pedestal above everybody else and judge others for their own decisions? Now again, the healthy obsession with healthy eating or the obsession with healthy eating can go too far and can become dangerous. It can spiral out of control and cause adrenal fatigue, underactive thyroid, amenorrhea in women, which is a loss of period, strange rashes, obsessions with other things around them, malnourished with vitamin deficiency, low bone density, loss of weight, dizziness, difficulty digesting, and social isolation, again, losing out on life by withdrawing, or just withdrawing because of fear that they're gonna consume the wrong thing, and then they're away from their friends and family, and life is about fun, and, and a lot of times we enjoy food socially, whether it be birthday parties or just getting together. Food should be out of love and sharing, and when food can become this um, unhealthy in the mind, you can lose your social life, and and then besides your your health and mental health, it can be very dangerous. But the good thing is, it's treatable. You can get re-educated in nutrition, and a lot of times it is not an obsession with being thin, but rather being healthy. So if it comes to performance, and you want to get back on track because you're tired and you're not getting enough nutrients, and it's it's affecting your athleticism. It's easier to get back on track because of performance versus the anorexics and bulimics who obsess about being thin. They're more rational. Orthorexics are more rational than anorexics and bulimics. And I believe that's why also it is not termed and coined an official term in, um, as an official eating disorder. Now today my interview is going to be with Sarah of Mary Fit. She has actually gone through both being an over-exerciser and having orthorexia. She was able to educate herself and get out of it on her own. And she is all about sustainable, healthy eating, maintaining a wonderful lifestyle that's enjoyable. She's created the Liberated Fitness Playbook, and it goes through everything as far as the psychological of how someone got there and how they can get back to maintaining a fun, healthy, sustainable, healthy, happy lifestyle. Sarah of Mary Fit is certified nutrition through the ISSA, or International Sports Science Association, to all of you and learn more about orthorexia. Today we're gonna be highlighting a very, kind of a hidden eating disorder that not a lot of people know about. I mean, it's out there, but it's very hard to understand, and that's gonna be orthorexia. But before we get into your great knowledge about it, can you tell us a little bit about your um, your fitness and sports background and why you got into fitness and training in the first place? Yeah, so I've been passionate about fitness for about nine years. Um, I took a different path in college, but I ended up 
realizing fitness is my purpose in life and became a certified personal trainer, a certified yoga instructor. I've been doing that a little bit longer and then a certified nutritionist as well. Um, I've done about every type of fitness that you can imagine out there, tried it all. And yeah, I really just like to dabble in a lot of different types. And now I can share that knowledge with my clients and I'm studying plant-based nutrition and passing along that information to my clients as well. So I just try to get as much information as I can and share that and hopefully it'll benefit people like it's benefited me. Can you explain the differences between a nutritionist and an RD? Because there's a lot of controversy. A lot of people, a lot of nutritionists will give too much information where they're not really allowed to versus an RD has that extra, extra few years of, of, uh, of, of schooling. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, a nutritionist is really just a certification that you can get that you are licensed to give nutrition advice, but you're not allowed to give meal plans or like, specifically come up with a program for someone because you don't have the background of the, the medical background basically of a dietitian because they go to college and get a four-year degree okay. but for what I wanted to do a nutritionist is sufficient uh, certification because I'm just giving people general advice I'm not dealing with the medical side of things and I always refer out when I need to right. and so I think there's definitely space for both of them in fitness just different purposes. Absolutely. What are there certain things you absolutely just cannot recommend? Like, do you, do you have a partner RD that you always refer some people to if, if need be? I mean, I have some connections to some dietitians. I, I haven't yet established a relationship where I'm referring out because I haven't come into, I haven't come across the problem of something being outside of my scope of practice hmm. yet. Um, I haven't, given people meal plans, but I've just gone over food logs and um, suggested like macros and things to follow like that. Um, but I haven't yet come into that problem, but I definitely, that is something I want to do is establish a relationship with the dietitian so that we can refer each other. Yeah, that's perfect. Because I had gotten nailed one time. I, I was not a nutritionist at all or even certified. And as an instructor, somebody came up to me Oh, sure. I'll help you out. I was giving them all these meal plans. I had no idea that it was so highly illegal. This was like quite a few years ago when I was just an idiot. Um, but I, I got in, in severe trouble for, for suggesting. And mm. um, we can only say, this is what I do. I don't recommend it for you, but this is what I do. That's the only proper speak that we can say if we're not certified at all. So, so what was your career trajectory? You went from fashion merchandising and um, what else did you say? And then you went to, to training. What Spanish. Was Spanish. Well, I'm sure that these all blend well, though. I mean, any experience you have, any degree you have, you're going you're gonna to be using it for any clients. So, I, you know, to, to kind of max, or morph them together. Why, why did you change? What was the flip? Um, I'm definitely still passionate about fashion and a lot of the things that I learned like marketing and merchandising and business skills, I am using to this day with my fitness business. But a lot of the people in my fashion program ended up going into the corporate level of like department stores and these super mainstream kinds mm -hmm. of businesses. And I'm personally really into ethics and sustainability. And so if I worked in fashion, I would only want to work for an ethical or sustainable fashion company. Sure. And I could have gone that route, but it's it's a little bit hard to break into the industry as well. They want you to have experience. And how do you get experience if you don't get into the industry? But I kind of realized that I didn't want a office job or a 40 hour week type typical job. So yeah. I, I, I really like to be on the move and I like to do lots of different things. And I didn't feel like I could actively help people in a position like a lower position in the fashion industry so and I realized that fitness is something that has always been a part of my life and that was really my purpose in life so sure I, and the two go hand in hand a lot and you know what the sky's the limit because with athleisure wear this is the new this is the biggest up-and-coming fashion lines 
for anybody. Look at Prada, like everybody, even the high end designers are, it's athleisure wear. So you're really going to be marrying the two of your skills together, I think. So, well, yeah. what, a, what an interesting change. And, and again, they all, I think it goes, kind of goes back and forth and it will help lend on both sides. So where, when you grew up in your household, because you said you have a sports background and fitness background, how did you grow up in your house? I'm, I'm more specific, I'm more interested in your nutrition aspect of how you grew up in your family, because I also am originally from the Midwest and a lot of our dietary, well, especially I was from Wisconsin, so it's a dairy state. Did you find um, growing up in Detroit that there was a lot of more organic food or, I mean, it's, it's kind of foreign because a lot of these didn't come into play until you get to the coast. It's like, Ooh, that's kind of like she, she eating. Do you see in Detroit a big, like a big issue with, with nutrition or food deserts where you are? Yes, that is a huge issue. Um, I don't think we have as much access here as some bigger cities. And I've done some work in Detroit with some urban gardens. Um, I did a couple summers ago, I worked at a few of them. And it, there is definitely a rising movement of people trying to be in control of their food source, which is really awesome. And people growing their own food and then harvesting it and sometimes selling it to other people. Um, and that's really empowering to them. But there's, there's still a great lack of uh, resources, especially in actual Detroit. Um, there's not a lot of grocery stores and Whole Foods came in and Whole Foods decided to charge three times what they normally charge in Detroit, even though it's a lower income area. And so it's definitely just creating this scarcity of, and a lot of people that aren't actually from the city of Detroit go to Detroit to just to go to Whole Foods and to buy food. And so you have people from outside of the city dominating the space and the people inside the city can't afford the food. But there, I mean, there are positive things like Eastern market. We have the biggest like farmer's market every weekend. And there's a lot of local farmers that are being empowered through things like that. Um, but yeah, it's not great. It's definitely improving, but yeah, but it's like a it thank can, you, but no thank you. I mean, it's just, it doesn't really, it didn't fit the market. Are there all these in that area? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I find that to be a fabulous grocery store that, that is super low price and has a ton of produce. So yeah, but this, unfortunately, these things are happening all over and I get so spoiled being in Los Angeles where there's just any kind of market you want and any any prices. So it's, it's a, you go like a million different places. Do you see a lot of ordering being done on Amazon prime to those areas at all? Yeah, that's really popular. We have a lot of different food delivery services as well okay. here. Um, and especially with COVID that's become a really popular way to get food for people, but there's still a lot of people that just don't have access. And there's still a lot of organizations that are trying to get, get food out to people. So good. Well, yeah, I'd love to see that. Um, so in your own family, what did you, how did you grow up? What sports did you actually play? Um, I, I didn't really play any sport in a committed sense. Uh, I was more into fitness and working out, yeah. um, but I did, I did do track and soccer and tennis, um, just kind of dabbled in a lot of things. Cause that's kind of my, my style is dabbling. Like I like to do a lot of everything. Um, but it wasn't really super emphasized in my household, uh, nutrition or fitness. So okay. when I got into it around the age of 15, I got super into it and super into health and fitness. And it was kind of like, uh, I'm going to do better than what my parents taught me type sure. <laughs> message, which they, they had certain feelings about, but I think a lot of people grow up and it's kind of, it's not really emphasized. So they don't really develop a relationship to fitness that is healthy or, you know, maybe it, it's emphasized in the wrong way that they get messages of diet culture and things that are harmful or it's just not talked about at all. And then they don't have any knowledge of it. So I had to do a lot of my own learning about and, and, it. And it's almost like peer pressure within the family. You almost have to defend how you do that. I mean, even, even the holidays has wreaked so much havoc on people going home when 
they may eat healthy and their, their parents don't or their families don't, and they make fun of them and they're like actually nasty to them. So that's interesting. So, which leads us to the, the shame of dieting or, you know, people, people will put that in front of you like, Oh, you're eating too healthy. So we're, a lot of us are familiar with the different aspects of eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia, but orthorexia is something fairly new. Can you describe in your, in your words what that means and what that looks like for someone? Yeah, so orthorexia is healthy eating obsession. Um, it seems like a good thing from the outside to people that you are concerned with the quality of what you're eating, but it really overtakes your life and food becomes the main focus of your life and eating pure, healthy, and good becomes correlated to being a good person, healthy foods are falsely correlated to being good, and thus unhealthy foods are bad, and food really loses its joy and pleasure to you because it's only for health purposes. And people with orthorexia have highly restricted diets, but they're proud of it. They often boast about which food categories they don't consume and kind of boast about it and brag about it to other people. And people might not realize that that is an obsessive way of thinking, and it's not normal to restrict yourself to that degree. Um, but it really takes away a lot from the person's life because they are preoccupied with something that should come more intuitively and naturally to them, but they mm -hmm. calculate everything to where it's perfect, which perfection either will lead you to being malnourished and harming yourself or you will inevitably fail and then feel like a failure because you failed. So it's just this nasty cycle of perfection and either fulfilling it or not fulfilling it, but your, your mental health and your physical health is harmed either way. Absolutely. Can you describe, and do you, do you see that orthorexia can be a gateway drug basically, so to speak towards anorexia or bulimia? Um, it can be, or, the difference between anorexia and bulimia and orthorexia, orthorexic people are not necessarily concerned with their weight and the way that their body looks. They may also be concerned with those things, but it's more about an obsession about the quality of the food that they're consuming and making sure that it's organic and that it's healthy just for the sake of being healthy because they health is so important to them. But people with anorexia and bulimia are usually overly preoccupied with body image and their weight. So I don't usually see the two kind of mixing, but it is possible that if your obsession with health has led you to also be obsessed with body image, then you could also fall into the other categories as well. Okay. Do you think that there could be more men then in that, in that area? Because... I'm thinking like bodybuilders that just want to eat super clean and they may not be as into being thin and perfect as to, you know, to kind of like look at the bulimics and the anorexics. I would see that some men would go more towards this than, than women um, in the scope of, I don't know. Cause I mean, I do see, I do see men suffering with eating disorders, but I think of the three orthorexia would be probably the one where they would become obsessed. Have you seen that with any of your clients? Um, not with my clients, but I have seen it in my personal life. A lot of people I've met in fitness spaces, a lot of men are into bodybuilding and powerlifting, and they do have an obsessive relationship with food. And it, it, to me, it's just, it's what those categories of fitness push people to do. Because when you're bodybuilding and powerlifting, you're doing things for an external motivation and some sort of external praise, you're not internally motivated. So everything that you do, basically all your patterns are going to align with some sort of external ideal that has nothing to do with, with what's actually healthy for your mind, body, and spirit, which is why I don't occur. Like I don't work with anyone in that kind of space. Cause that is not what I, I don't, I don't believe in, um, having patterns around fitness that are not for health or for looks you. and um, yeah. So will you turn down certain aspects of, of clients? Like if they're coming to you, Oh, you know, Sarah, we would like to, you know, we're training for a, for a 
figure competition or bodybuilding competition, do you just gently say, you know, I don't, I don't cover that because I really want to maintain what you want to do, like healthy, normal, quote unquote, if we can even use the word normal anymore. Do you just simply turn them down and refer them elsewhere? Yes, I, okay. I definitely would. There might be someone out there. There probably is someone out there that would be better to work with them. But based on my personal history of disorder eating as well, I don't, I would never work with someone that I think could trigger my own disordered eating is another aspect to it that I don't think you should ever take on a client that would cause you more harm. Absolutely. And is this, it, it, without getting too personal and you certainly don't have to, is there something that you have faced in your past to overcome? Oh yeah. Yes. I mean, I personally had orthorexia and exercise addiction and that was something that I suffered from for many years without really being aware of it until a doctor pointed it out to me, um, which is why I want to help people because I think a lot of people suffer from it and aren't even aware because yeah. in mainstream fitness spaces, it, it's encouraged to have restrictive, restrictive, obsessive behaviors and people don't realize that that's not healthy. It's not good for you. What can, if you would, do you mind sharing what was happening? Like, did you lose your period right away? Was your skin or nails, what had been affected when you got really bad and just didn't yeah. know it? So all of the above, I had the female athlete triad. So I went to the doctor and she diagnosed me with that. And I was super confused because I wasn't an athlete per se, but I did work out about three hours a day and I wasn't consuming enough because I was orthorexic and I was so obsessed with what I was eating that I just, I wouldn't eat processed food. I wouldn't eat so many things I wouldn't eat and therefore I wasn't getting in enough calories and so my body weight was too low and she told me I was on the fast track to osteoporosis and infertility and reproductive issues and it was really a reality check to me that she said you either have to start eating more or you have to start working out less and I walked out of there and I was like there's no way I'm doing either of those things but I eventually learned I had to because what I was doing wasn't healthy. I was telling myself it was for health, but it truly wasn't. So, and it kind of was like a, it was, it was hard to really look at it and be like, well, why am I doing this stuff then? If it's, it's not for health, it's truly not for health, but I've been telling myself for years that it's for health. So right. I had to do a lot of like self-discovery to get through that and realize why was I actually doing it? And why did I need to have this extreme control over those behaviors. And in the meantime, you were probably getting complimented by certain people or actually berated by other people, maybe insulted, like it just you're too skinny. And I'm sure it, it comes on both sides. But being in the professional industry on camera as well, we are absolutely rewarded for being of a certain kind. And there's a, a very, very famous fitness person out there who has, I think, 120 videos. And she said that, you know, the producer of, of the, her training video called her husband and said, listen, we need this person to lose like just a few more pounds to get the ideal look for the population that's going to be purchasing the video. And the, and the fitness person was already so low body fat and she was working out like six hours a day just to maintain a little bit of energy to do the videos. And when, once they started and went on camera for this particular project, she could barely make it through because she was just, she was just dragging and she got tons and tons and tons of compliments on Instagram and social media, thousands in fact. And two of those thousands, two people said, what's wrong with you? You look terrible. So it's like rewarded, rewarded, rewarded. And she said the minute she showed up that day on that particular project, the producer was like, Oh, you look amazing. And it was bad because this male producer had called her husband and like went above her to tell well, you might want to tell your wife that she might need to lose a couple more pounds. So it's just like, oh, and that was just very personal. So it gets, it gets really personal. And then like when you yourself started eating better, quote unquote, you know, as far as eating, adding more and then exercising less, how did that feel? That's, it, it's almost like you're in this cage and then you have to like start over again. Was it hard for you to do? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I recovered without any outside help. Um, I got myself through it somehow, and it took many years, but 
I, like I said, I had to really dig deeper into why I was doing what I was doing and uncover my triggers. And, you know, like I had developed this unhealthy relationship with food and fitness at some point, And I had to figure out why it was. And a lot of it was like the internalized messages from the media about that. I was never doing enough. Basically when I was a teenager and adolescent, I subscribed to all of the women's magazines, like all of the fitness magazines, all of the fashion magazines. And they all had these messages of basically you're not doing enough. You're not good enough. You need to work out more. You need to eat better. And even though I was already at this extremely high level of discipline, I felt like I was constantly being told that I wasn't doing enough and I had to do more and do better. And I had to let go of that kind of messaging and just be like, no, it's enough. What I'm doing is enough. And, and if I'm not living a lifestyle that's bringing me joy or giving me freedom, then what's the point? Because I can never gain back those years that I lost to this obsession and this addiction. But now I can move forward and I know that my relationship to food and fitness is completely transformed, completely different now. And I can't imagine going back to where I was, but I definitely see how it developed and, and I'm really proud of myself for getting through it. I'm proud of you because I, I know firsthand how hard that can be. Um, were you, were you kind of taking yourself away from friends? Like, were you worried about going to a birthday party or going to the bar or whatever? because you didn't even want to assume alcohol, consume alcohol, because that would be too many calories. I mean, did you even go to that route of sort of taking yourself? Yeah. Away? Yeah, I definitely did. Um, I guess when I realized it was really getting bad again, after, you know, years I had heard years after hearing from my doctor that it was a problem, I was still struggling with it. And it was very shameful. Like, why am I still struggling with this? But you just get set in these patterns but I was in college and they had these fitness classes offered in the dorms and I would go to every single one that they possibly had and that I, that I could possibly go to if I wasn't in class. And if a friend asked me to hang out or if there was a social event or a club, I would turn down those things to go to a fitness class. And that's when I realized like this problem has not gone away it's dominating my life. My life revolves around fitness. All I think about all the time is what I'm going to eat and when I'm going to work out and what I'm going to do when I work out, how many calories I'm going to burn. And it, it, it wasn't healthy. There was no balance there. It was extremely, you know, it was dominating my life. And especially being in college and ha- having so many other things to focus on and to devote my time to, I had to take a hard look at myself and realize like, if I don't change, you know, I'm probably, I'm not going to develop other areas of my life. I'm not going to have relationships. I'm not going to have friendships. I'm not going to have a social life. Is it really worth it? Like, what am I really gaining out of this? And slowly started to pull back from it and become less and less restrictive and obsessive. But like you said, the triggers are absolutely everywhere. I mean, you can go to the grocery store and stand in line or just everything. And then it's on the opposing side. And interestingly enough, so you do kind of agree that social media and the media really put you towards that plus being in, in our business. Correct. Cause it yes. is. Basically. Yes. I mean, I, I would say since I first had my issues, it's gotten a lot better with, you know, they now depict people with larger bodies as being healthy and being normal. Um, not so much skinny is, is depicted as healthy or beautiful, but it's definitely still a problem especially with the messages of restriction and especially with the holidays and the new year, the diet messages um, right. that a lot of people just don't know that they can, they can decide to not consume those types of messages. Like you have, a, you have the option to not consume that type of messaging and to not listen to it. But right. a lot of people, they're so plugged into mainstream media you have to realize that mainstream media is not your friend and diet culture is a billion dollar industry that just wants to sell products to you by telling you you're not good enough and you need their products. So they're never going to go away unless we stop ignore, unless we start ignoring them and we stop buying into it. Right. Have you even had people, I've had people come up to me myself like, Oh, what do you do? What, what, what pill do you take? 
no, there's not, I don't take a pill. I don't take drugs for this. This is um, sustainability, a deficit and surplus of calories and exercise, but even mine can get very obsessive as well. But I just, like you said, it's a billion dollar industry. Everybody wants a quick fix. And I know that I, 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 just, I think I heard that the elimination diet is also leading to people becoming orthorexics because eliminating, oh, eliminating that oil. And now they're saying extra virgin olive oil. Absolutely not. Don't touch it. That's where is the Mediterranean diet says, yes, no, this is the best oil we can, we can consume. So, but quickly back to the social media, there was a recent, I believe it was Cosmopolitan. And I think it was the cover. I have not seen it, but I heard it on another a fitness podcast where they said it was a very overweight person on the uh, model on the front and saying, this is the new, this is the new, this is what healthy looks like. But that goes the other extreme as well. And I think, and I'm all for it self-love and everybody type should be embraced, of course. And who's to say, I mean, I can very much argue that someone who's looks overweight is probably healthier than I am myself with, with the way that they probably have a better, a better iron levels, everything like that. But for what it looks like on the outside, it may not be that way. And people would look at them as being obese. And really, let's face it with BMI, that's a really slippery slope. I mean, that's a measure, me, measure that doctors use, but a BMI doesn't even have to be that high for someone to be obese. And then they kind of like, and then it wreaks havoc in the brain and then it, it's a downward spiral. So do you see media that's going towards like, in, in Cosmopolitan of, of, all, of all, you know, magazines, that is a really, that's pretty much a fashion magazine if we really look at it in pop culture. And you know what? They're, sell, they're there to sell the magazines. They're not there to get in the psychology of you know, what people may be hurt by. They're there to sell the magazines and people are going to buy it. And I, I would have bought it because what an interesting article. So there's got to be a, a, a balance somewhere, but I agree. I mean, it is, it's, it's all around us, all around us. And I really admire you for the strength especially getting through it yourself because most people have to go to treatment and kind of start over. And I think that most, most of those, most of the times they fail because it is an addiction and then addiction, addiction falls back. So these are serious, serious issues. And the hard thing about eating disorders is they, they're killers because they're silent killers. I mean, it can be, it's, it, we could have a heart attack when the body fat's too low or, not getting enough iron or, or things are shutting down. And it's like, you don't know. And it doesn't always show on the outside or you can tell sometimes if there's a heroin addict, you could almost tell But with eating disorder. Sometimes you can't. And especially orthorexics, they can look super muscular and healthy and like vibrant, like a toothpaste commercial, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's tough, but I, I really admire you, especially were you so regimented at some of these points where you couldn't really go to bed unless you had that militant discipline of like, I know that I did this many calories. I know that I only ate this much. Like if you had a little bit more of something, would that make you nuts in the head? Yeah. I mean, if I consume sugar or sodium, I would cry and like things that your body needs. <laughs> you can't completely cut out sugar and sodium. So it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I wasn't happy until I, until I reached what I wanted to reach for the day, but there really was no limit. Like I would work out for three hours, say, and I would also work out while I was watching TV and I would work out while I was in the shower and I would work out while I was brushing my teeth. Any spare moment I had, I would be working out because I, I was convinced that that was healthy and that was a great way to use my time. Um, sure. But it's still, it was never enough. And that's really what it is. Like, there's never a point where these people with exercise addiction or orthorexia are going to say, that is enough. I'm healthy enough. Because that's the messaging that we get. We don't get messaging saying that you're doing good enough and you are good enough. And the way your body is right now is how you should accept it and love it. And maybe you don't need to change. Even if, like, even if you're in a larger body, maybe you don't want to change and that's perfectly fine. And no one knows your health on the outside. You can't tell someone's health by looking at them. So, and a lot of people have larger weight set points as well. So we're not all meant to be the same body size and shape. I think personally, I think that'd be really weird and disturbing if we all look the same 
Um, and you know, we can follow the exact same diet and fitness regimen as someone else and look entirely different from them. Absolutely. But, and I'm glad that we're getting these messages now, like Cosmo showing, I think they had like seven different people or something. Yeah. Showing, yeah, this is healthy and that's healthy. And a lot of people were really upset at that. And that to me is like, it really upset me and triggered me kind of that people were uh, upset that they were showing, depicting bodies and saying that they were healthy when you don't know anything about that person's health. Like you're not that person's doctor. You can't, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. You like that person could be working out more than you're working out. They could be eating better than you're eating, but you just have a faster metabolism or you have a lower weight set point. But I'm glad to see that it's happening. And I hope people, um, you know, learn more. And I personally, with my business and my social media, I try to spread the opposite messages and the opposite of awareness of that diet culture is harmful to everyone, no matter what size your body is. And that we need to accept people in all bodies because larger bodies are oppressed. They're oppressed by society and mm-hmm. you, it's not right that, you know, just because you're in a different body that you're deemed less valuable and you have to go through all of these roadblocks in life. Right. Um, so I'm, big, I'm trying to be a part of the, the healthy, sorry. healthier side. No, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And, and per your point, I just remember when Ronda Rousey, when she was in her prime, you know, the MMA fighter and then she, a bunch of men had said, Oh, that is so not sexy. She looks to, and she, and, and she was in Vogue. She was interviewed in Vogue. She's like, I'm not here. For men to look at me as sexy, I'm a killer, and this is what I'm. I'm a machine, and this is what I'm built for. But even that strong messaging, I'm sure she may have felt at some point, screw you. It just people have so many opinions, and it's really hard. And you know, and back to the maybe orthorexia or even on the anorexic side, you know, we've gotten together a, a bunch of girlfriends for like a pool party or something, and and someone was you know, struggling and they were really underweight and everybody was like making fun of that person. And, and she came and told me, she goes, well, a bunch of people at at the end called me later and said, what are you doing? You look great. You know, how can I get that? So berating her in front of her and then calling her like, what are you doing? You know, so it's just, it's all these mixed messages. And when you said that you could, you got through it yourself and it was just a mental, it was a mental power of, no, I see that but I know that's not right. That's a real testament to you because especially if you're surrounded in an industry, like being in entertainment, you are rewarded for it constantly. Or on the other side of that, I have been told you're too thin for this role. It, it doesn't make sense. And we want more of a real person. So then you walk away thinking, am I not a real person? And then it's like, <laughs> it, it, it's a spiral. And I'm not like, you know, saying rah, rah for myself, but I have, I, I, I see it and I go through it as well. So I, I hear everything you're saying and I, I understand and empathize because it, it, it is a big problem. And, you know, the, I really wanted to cover this particular eating disorder because people know about anorexics or bulimics and, and people sometimes, and people don't even know that someone's like, oh, anorexics throw up. No, they don't. That's bulimia. There's all these different things. And orthorexia is a very big deal just because, take your example of whole foods, you can't, Maybe you want that apple, but you know that over here, well, this apple's organically modified to, to be way healthier for you. And then maybe if you are like struggling with that, it's an apple, but you already know over here that this apple is better for you. It's just like, but you're already eat, eating an apple, which is 10 times better than Jack in the Box. You know, so it's just, it has to be a balance and, it, and it's difficult. Um, but do you see the signs in your clients? Like, can you kind of spot it a mile away? Um, yes. <laughs> can you? Okay. Yes, I can. I, I see so many people showing the signs that I showed and, you know, like I said, people didn't know that I was, that I had a problem when I did. And I did get a lot of praise uh, still to this day. Um, I mean, the other day I was telling a story about how I went through orthorexia and this person walked up in the middle of the story and they didn't hear the first part where I said I used to have orthorexia which is an eating disorder and I used to have exercise addiction and I was talking about how I cut out so many different types of food 
chips, candy, soda, fast food, junk, like any junk food, any sugar, any sodium. And they were like, wow, good for you. That's awesome. And I'm like, you missed the first part of the story where I said I was miserable and I had an eating disorder and I'm not like that anymore. And they're like, oh, yeah. But still like, you know, people will praise you for something that is unhealthy. And so to me, it's all about personal accountability because you also can't control what messages people put out there. You, even if Cosmo put out something that was all skinny people and said, this is healthy, you can't control that. That's, that's not in our control. It's, it sucks the way that mainstream culture and media goes, but right. the only thing that you can control is yourself. And I'm really big into curating your feed and curating your life so that you're only surrounded by positive influences. And I mean, also learning how to get through being triggered and like, I've been triggered many times by diet culture since I've recovered, but I have not reverted to my old ways because I know that I'm better now and I don't need to succumb to these messages that say I'm not good enough. Um, So, you know, learning how to withstand those messages is something that we all need to do because it does affect all of us, whether you're in a smaller body or a larger body, we're all told we're not good enough. And we're all told that we need to fit some norm or some idea, like, usually Eurocentric beauty standard and that excludes uh, pretty much everyone. I mean, it's impossible to fit this beauty standard. That's always changing anyways. You know, one year it's like having a bigger butt the next year it's having a smaller butt. Like it's constantly changing. And it's like, you have to just realize that that is entirely made up and it's entirely to tell us that we're not good enough so that we keep buying products to feel good enough and that we keep wanting to change ourselves. And I think really what it does, especially for women is distracts us from a real purpose in life and keeps us from achieving our purpose in life and doing something that's actually benefiting the world. So it's definitely a function of the patriarchy and it's definitely something that we need to reject so that we can all fulfill our purpose is my, my belief. Sure. Sure. But you're still right back on that one point of, you can't maintain some, you can't achieve some of these body types. It's impossible. For example, there's a lot of trainers here who say, and maybe you've stumbled upon this yourself. So many women want, you know, the, just the V shape as far as the thigh gap goes, but they want a big ass and thighs. So, but that's not real. I've worked, I've worked with some of these people that are extremely bloated and in, in injected. It's not, real it and you can't actually move properly there's certain things and there's a lot of plastic surgery in los angeles of course and it sometimes they they just they it, it really throws off their walk with all the hip imp, there's hip implants and the you know the butt implants and i watched someone kind of like try trying to walk and it could have been like post surgery like right away but their mechanics were off and then that shows in different areas and then if the next trend's going to be 70s heroin chic again where they look like hippies and really skinny and in heroin heroin out you know rock stars what are they going to do they are they going to get that all dejected just to face just to face the norm um but again i am proud of you too because i do have a friend who was an exercise anorexic so badly that she ended up in a wheelchair and she just hit a milestone as of late of eating toast it was the first time she'd ever touched toast and for wow. a year. Yeah. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty cool thing. And some people could hear this and like laugh it would, that it's just so ridiculous, but until you get there, you can't judge and, and it's in your head and it, it throws you off. Um, and I also can't imagine when that, when that female doctor, it was, did you have a female um, athletic doctor? Okay. Did they, t- when they, did you have to go back in and get like measured and weighed again? And then maybe you saw the scale go up and it drove me crazy or um I didn't go back to the doctor for a while after that because I I think I was kind of was kind of mad about the situation and what I was being told to do but I did go back to the doctor after a couple of years maybe when I because when I was in the worst of it I was doing so much cardio and that's why my body weight was so low and I wasn't doing a lot of strength training Okay. So, and I, I had not yet discovered the magic of strength training. So I was right. doing like three hours a day of cardio and not, not eating enough, which is why my body weight was so low. But I eventually got into strength training, which I 
loved and changed my life because I realized I could do a lot shorter workout, but it was a lot more effective and, um, and better for your bones and, and everything too. Yeah. And I went, I went back to the doctor after a few years after I started strength training and I realized, found out that I had gained like 20 or 30 pounds of muscle. And that was a huge like shock to me, like looking at the scale and I'm just like, is that right? Like, but that was what my body weight should have been all that time. And And you probably looked exactly the same, just more toned. Yeah. I mean, I filled out more. I was a lot more muscular and people still praise me either way, but you know, people's comments didn't matter to me because I was a lot happier with this, the later version of myself after I had developed a healthier relationship with exercise. I was exercising a normal amount of hours and, um, yeah, I, I had found a lot more moderation in life. And like you were saying about the, your friend eating toast, like every time to this day I eat sugar, I like do happy dance because I'm like, I would have never eaten any of these things years ago and I would have missed out on so much joy in life. Sure. sure. But it's just so deceiving because it's like, you know, like that person said who even obviously didn't hear the beginning of your presentation. Oh, good for you. Because that sounds like, oh, someone's cutting out chips and, and, and sodas and all these things. Oh, good for you. That's, that's great. And that should be because it's like, you know, we, we know that that's unhealthy sugars, but when it gets to that extreme, so it is a really slippery slope because in hindsight, good job. That sounds fantastic. But you know, then it goes the opposite way. And especially in the Midwest, I'm, I'm originally from there as well. And it's like, you can't go wrong with some of these Lay's and Doritos. I mean, it's just, it's a different, it's a lot different, um, you know, style of eating. And I don't mean to stereotype different regions, but there, there is a distinct difference. When I left Wisconsin and moved to New York City, huge extreme. And then New York City to LA, even bigger extreme because it may be disciplined and weird there in certain cases, but even more so here, just because it, this is basically the mecca of the fitness and entertainment industry or was in fact pre-COVID. You know, we don't really have anything right now, but still it's, it's uh, and you may stick out in your area because you do cut these things out and people don't. And then they make fun of you for, why, why don't you eat that? And that, that could trigger something else again but you're strong. You're strong now. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that you weren't strong before. It just affected, it affected you in a different way, which makes you so much better for your clients and so much better in helping people. So I think it's really fantastic. What would you suggest if someone was facing this and they said, you know, Sarah, I don't know what to do. What, what, you know, what did you do? What should I do? Where would you suggest for them? Because some people may not be as strong as you are. Yeah, well, I recently developed my own program where it's a three-month program and each month is a different phase. And so the first month is getting your mental health right because usually with this kind of disorder, there's an underlying mental health issue, anxiety, depression, OCD, all of them. And getting your mental health in order really helps. You know, the mental health is the anchor for all the health is what I say. And so the first month is focused on mental health so that you can get it to a point where you can modify your behavior. The second phase is based on developing a healthy fitness routine where you are adhering to a exercise regimen and a nutrition regimen that is healthy, balanced, and intuitive. So it's no longer defined by external influences and it does bring you joy and it makes you feel good in all parts of your body and your mind. And then the third phase is all about transforming your mindset around food and fitness and around your body as well. So unlearning the negative messages of diet culture and relearning concepts like body positivity and body neutrality, learning that, learning more about your life purpose and that you are more than just a body and you're more than just fitness and what you eat. So this is my three phase program that I've developed and I truly believe it will help people based on my personal experience. This is what I use to help me through Um, I don't think that there are a lot of resources out there for people suffering from this problem, which is why I wanted to create my own program to offer to people. um, Because that you are in Detroit. So could anybody get this? I mean, do you do both the online training and this online program? And would you be able to do like a zoom consultation with them if they were to just kind of like 
you know, spill their, spill their guts, so to speak, and just be really honest about the process. Um, but then again, it's hard because if you don't have a psych degree, are you able to? So that's a slippery slope too. But I think just judging the fact that you've gone through it and you know, and you're only sharing your experiences and helping to the, to the point, any, and your help is better than what's out there. It's just scary because when we make suggestions, there's so many degrees that don't allow you to, well, you can't say that if you don't have this and this and this degree, but I think someone would love to go to you and listen to you and, and be helped by, by you. So that's wonderful. Um, so we'll, I'll put everything in the notes and you on, are on Instagram at M-E-R-R-I dot fit and on Facebook <laughs> at Mary fit. Um, I'll put all the links to everybody below, but what are your, what are your goals as far as the future goes? Yeah. Um, I mean, my goals are to help people get through what I went through, basically, to help be a part of the change of liberated fitness is what I like to call it. Helping people not develop an obsessive and restrictive relationship to food and fitness and to find body acceptance, body trust and and self-love. Um, I really want to help a lot of people through this. I want to coach a lot of people through my program that I've developed and hopefully you know be a part of this change that's going on and and inspire and influence a lot of people online um outside of that i want to travel the world and uh serve the world in whatever other ways that i can i like to dabble in a lot of different things fitness is my main passion and my life purpose i believe but i also you know i like giving back in whatever ways i can so whatever i learn whatever i accomplish in life I like to turn around and you know share it with others so you will and that's amazing um and then I, one one question I forgot to ask you is when you went to this doctor did they did they make you increase your levels of iron or calcium or vitamin b12 do you remember certain things that you needed to add back in the diet or you have to watch still today because they they dip low because of what 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 you've gone through no, I don't think my blood work was abnormal, um, oddly enough. I definitely think if you have this problem, you should get blood work done um, and talk to a doctor first and foremost and talk to a therapist, which I am not. But, you know, my program is kind of like the, the non-medical side of things, but definitely the medical side is needed as well. But I don't think my blood work was abnormal. Um, I was basically just told to eat more. Like, it just was a pure, like, calorie issue um so i wasn't given any specifics personally it's such bad advice like eat more okay you don't even understand what goes on in this head i can't stand that well just oh just yeah. well, eat more exercise less okay well all right uh, you, you can't it's impossible yeah. it, it is it complete like you said it, your whole beginning of your phase of fitness with your program is that is just going through what why is this happening the triggers and i'm sure also I mean, we, we all know it, in the sports of, of some of these, you know, whether it be figure skating, I'm a former NFL cheerleader. So we literally were weighed in and body fats were taken at every at the practices. So it's in your face. There's no avoidance of it. But I, at the time, loved it. You know what I mean? It's like I was using it as an excuse. And it's like, okay, then, I'm, then I have to. Then I have to eat clean if someone were to make a comment, you know, so... Oh, that's, that's very interesting. But yeah, I'd love to talk to you more, more about that. And we'll, 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 we'll counsel back. I'd love to have you on the podcast again and, and share your experiences and see what, what other things you've added to your, added to your regimen. But otherwise, people follow her at merri.fit on Instagram and then Mary Fit on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you so much. And that was Sarah Maryfield of Mary Fit Fitness Training. Issa nutritionist and creator of the Liberated Fitness Playbook. Her passion for helping clients recover from obsessive eating to maintain a healthy, happy lifestyle has helped so many. You can find all of her links below as well as resources for mental health and eating disorders. We appreciate you for listening and please subscribe and rate this show on iTunes. You can also listen on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Luminary, Tuned In, or at Believe.com. You can reach out to me for any questions or topics you'd like covered on the show at Ann McDaniels. And I'll see you next time on So Cal Sweat.
Peut-être. <rire>